I'm Heather Clancy. I am a senior writer with GreenBiz, and um, what, one thing that Joel didn't know when he asked me to do this presentation is that uh, electronic waste is what got me writing for GreenBiz and for uh, and writing about green technology and technology's role in sustainability. And I am so privileged and proud to have Mark here today. Mark Bowles, he is the founder of a company called Eco ATM. And um, he's, he's got, this is your sixth startup, I think? Uh, sixth venture back startup. Six, six, I've but, had others that didn't get money. <laughs> um, he's been involved with the technology industry for a long time, um, and he has seven patents in kiosk technology, which I didn't know until I read your, uh, I, I've actually interviewed you several times, and I didn't, didn't key in on that. Um, but what I wanted to do first is what is an ACO ATM? I know it's in the demo pavilion. Um, we got a photo here. I actually convinced them to let me put some slides up. Explain to me what we're seeing here. What is an eco ATM? It's pretty simple, really. If you know, if you've seen a Coinstar machine or a Redbox machine, it's a kiosk, self-serve uh, retail kiosk uh, that uh, buys back your old used electronics for mm -hmm. cash on the spot. The whole process takes three or four minutes uh, from beginning to end. It uh, uses artificial intelligence, machine vision. Um, high-definition cameras and some electronic inspection to uh, evaluate your phone or tablet or mp3 player uh, very precisely and on a worldwide market we're actually hooked into an auction that that's a global auction uh, and we find the best price we can we present that if you uh, take that price we then ask you uh, for some personal information driver's license we actually get your thumbprint um, <laughs> And we're remotely actually, actually remotely viewing all of these transactions. Uh, we want to lower the threshold for honest people, and uh, but not lower the threshold for bad guys. And right. so we, we we put a lot of steps in but place. But you're actually too. giving cash for from and taking we pay, what? what? And what? we pay cash out on the spot. And how? What types of gadgets are you collecting? You know, at the moment we have a roadmap that goes beyond this. Uh, hopefully, but the uh, currently we're trying to get really, really good at what we do now, which is. Uh, mobile phones, tablets, mm -hmm. and MP3 players. So small things. Wait, this this thing. D give me a sense of how big it is. This is a tiny picture, but what what size are we talking about? Um, it's about four and a half, five feet tall. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, like a refrigerator, only shorter. And when we were talking, I mean, I, there's actually one in the in the mall near where I live. Mm -hmm. when I, I live near the big, huge Garden State Plaza Mall in New Jersey, Mall City, right? Of near your state of New Jersey. Um, this is taking in how many, you know, give us some stats here. I think you So we uh, just announced a month or so ago we passed our two millionth device. Mm -hmm. uh, that's from about a million customers. We get about two devices per customer. Um, we have almost a thousand, not quite a wait, thousand. Wait, wait, back up. So people come with two at a time and put them in and? 2.1. Well, nobody comes 2 with 2.1. <laughs> <but, you know, on laughs> the broken parts, yeah. Right. Well, sometimes they do, actually. Um, <laughs> there's close to a thousand in 45 states. We're not quite at a thousand yet. Um, and, uh, you know, the average time, uh, at least for phones, is about 18 months. We use them. And the life of that phone can actually be much longer than that. In fact, we've seen one iPhone come through our system about a year and a half apart three times now. Um, how, and, how long have these been in the field? Um, the original prototype, old Bessie, was uh, <laughs> four years ago. So the fully automated, about two and a half years. So. What gave you the, the idea to do this? I mean, why, why did you feel that this was an a, appropriate approach? I mean, the, the electronic waste problem is, I think, what, we're collecting like 40% maybe of the, of the mobile phones, and we go down, we go down from there. Well, actually, we don't even... Create, uh, collect 40% of the mobile phones. It's, it's more like that. 20, 25, yeah. yeah. But why is this something that we should all be concerned about in the room? You know, e-waste is, uh, is a, you know, the fastest growing part of the waste right. stream. And it's, uh, some of it's pretty nasty stuff. Phones in particular are not, they're not great, but they're not the worst of the offenders like leaded glass and, and uh, things like that, brominated plastics and so forth. Uh, but there's some nasty stuff in phones and tablets and so forth. And uh, probably but worse than just stuff the way. Too, right? Yeah, there's valuable stuff, but probably worse uh, for me, worse than the what it does in landfills and eventually to the water table and so forth, is all of the energy and resources in creating a new phone. So if you give a phone a second life, uh, you stop creation of a, another phone. And if you do that to two million phones, then uh, you make a big impact. You know, Coinstar 
Um, if you're familiar with Coinstar machines, they've been out for 15, 20 years now. That's the company that recently acquired us. But they have uh, gotten to a point where they're recycling about a third of the coins in the U.S. annually. Mm -hmm. And it turns out your phone drawer at home, everybody has the kitchen drawer full of phones, uh, fills up in terms of value and even volume at about the same rate as your coin jar, your pickle jar of coins. And so uh, it's a similar, and you know, we need to put these things in people's paths. Uh, not a special trip, you know, mm -hmm. to, to the zoo, to the charity box, but in your normal path and incentivize you and pay you what they're worth. How do I know what that is, though? If I, I'm walking in the mall, I see that thing, how do I possibly know what that's for? That's a, a good question. As uh, running marketing, I think about that all the time. Um, we have big digital signage, and I think over time, you know, nobody knew what a Coinstar machine is, and probably most people in the room to do any grocery shopping at all, know what a coin star machine is. So part of it's just, you know, over time. Uh, but it, it was a weird new concept when it came out, and it took a while for people to understand. What can you tell us about who's placing items in, this, in these kiosks at this point? Um, you know, mobile phones in particular have a 95% plus penetration rate. So our customer is really everybody above 18. So it really is, um, you know, the whole spectrum. Uh, of people. But uh, is, it, is it young people? Is it people of all ages? I mean, I'm just trying to understand the demographic a little bit better. Yeah, so our demographic is uh, heavy 18 to 30, mm -hmm. and then slightly less the next decade, and it sort of goes down over time. But that's probably uh, a reflection of uh, most of our kiosks are currently in malls. Right. We're moving uh, into Walmarts and grocery, and uh, so I think we'll see a little bit of a, a we see a skew now that's heavier, you know, younger than, than older. But I think uh, if we do our job well, at some point, hopefully we get in, you know, within five miles of 90% of the population, and mm -hmm. it's sort of a, a cross-section of everybody. Most of the, the carriers have a way of taking back their phones or tablets, their, in some, some cases, other mobile devices. Why is this something that is necessary? A few reasons. I think one of the things that we will take back anything. The carriers mm -hmm. don't necessarily take back all your old junk. We'll take anything. Um, and also, the carriers generally you do it in the in the uh, trade in trade up. Your two year contract expires, and we don't none of that. It's whenever you want it, and and it's also not store credit. It's cash. And so, for a lot of uh, people, I think that's a, a value proposition. Now, it's, I want to go back to the cash thing because that's that's a you know, to be able to dispense, I mean, this, this, that thing is doing a lot of very sophisticated processes. It's, it's handling a lot of sophisticated things. How did uh, you figure out how to collect and dispense at the same time? In other words, what partnerships, you, you mentioned Coinstar a couple of times. Mm -hmm. When you launched this thing, was that the first company that you went to? That, that's part one. And part two is what other partnerships have helped make this work? Yeah, as an entrepreneur, I, my first thing that I do when I think about a new business is who is the Elvis of this space <laughs> or the Elvises? And for me, it was Coinstar, a guy named Jens Molbach who started Coinstar, and I stalked him. I hunted him down mm -hmm. until he would talk to me and tell me what he knew. And eventually, he was an investor and was on my board. But he, uh, he was a good partner and introduced us to Coinstar, the company he had left uh, since then. And they were a you know, really great partner. Not only did they provide us a little bit of cash, but all the experience, the, the operational things of running a kiosk network and so forth. Um, the other big partnerships, I think, were, were uh, the channel itself. The channel for used mm. electronics is a big, giant, wild, wild west, um, you know, it's mom and pop to giant companies that has a tradition building a lot of rules. Um, it's maturing very quickly, a lot of standards coming in place. Um, but figuring that channel out, what they cared about, what they didn't, it's the most starved channel you can imagine. It just, it's a bottomless pit of as many used devices you can collect. And the hard part about the whole process is getting consumers to participate. Mm -hmm. And so our uh, value proposition, the, the assumptions we made was if you made it uh, really convenient in your weekly, monthly path and made it incentivized, immediately incentivized, that it would meet the threshold for the masses to actually participate. I did surveys, um, you know, and asked people, you know, would you use a, before we did it, would you use a kiosk if you did? And everybody, you know, 30 some percent said, I'd do it for charity, I wouldn't do it for cash. Um, I would do it for the environment, but I wouldn't care about the cash. And in reality, 
um, everybody wants the incentive. And, and in real life, you get you know mm -hmm. sort of you know one percent uh, spontaneous on charity and other things. So, you know, the the meeting the threshold. My I guess my insight, my special insight into the kiosk concept was how lazy consumers can be. And um, they, this met my threshold, and apparently it, it meets a lot of other people's how, Is there an average amount of money that these? Yeah, we, uh, I'm part of a public company now. We're not supposed to talk about that. And but, I, I, um, it's, a, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a bigger number than I think most people would assume. OK. We're going to come back to that Coinstar thing in a moment, because you did get bought. But I want to go to Elaine for um, sure. some sidebar questions first. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. I made it. Um, great. So I wanted to ask you, because there are a lot of questions about this. Um, once you collect the device, take us through the end of life. Mm -hmm. Are you collecting the devices and then they're going to Asia or Africa? What's going on? Yeah. So the, the, there's two streams, and the, the percentage varies uh, between 25 and 40 percent uh, of one stream is the uh, end of life, and so those get recycled, reclaimed. Mostly, it's for the precious metals. There's platinum, gold, palladium, silver, copper, tin that, that can be reclaimed. It's about a dollar, dollar twenty-five worth of uh, precious metals in each phone. And if you get that stuff back instead of mining it out of the ground, there's a lot of a lot of benefit. Um, the other uh, percentage, seventy-five to sixty percent, uh, is bound for refurbishment and finds a second life as the device it started as. So it gets refurbished and used. Uh, most of our flow is primarily in the U.S. Um, and insurance and warranty replacements, uh, they don't send you new phones. They send you uh, nice used ones that have been refurbed if they can. And some ends up offshore, uh, although uh, less and less for us. Most of it is domestic. Mm -hmm. Do you have certifications to, to manage that e-cycling part of it? We do. We have uh, ISO 14001. Mm -hmm. We have R2. Uh, we have an ISO 27001 that's around data. And so we're, we're, there wasn't a lot of standards in this business five years ago when we started, but it's matured very mm -hmm. quickly, and, and uh, we're happy about that. Okay. Is anything else from you, Elaine? Or? One of the questions is, how are the devices wiped so personal information isn't harvested? Um, Privacy, yeah. Well, obviously the ones that go into smelting uh, uh, the data, the bits go into the ether. Uh, the rest of them get wiped uh, to, unlike uh, hard drives in a PC, and the, uh, there's a lot of standards there, DOD standards, where because it's a physical magnetic medium and you can degauss it and wipe it, uh, phones and tablets have different memory structures in their flash memory. So those get wiped by the processes that, uh, that wipe those. And that's a bunch of individual software for individual uh, devices uh, based on their architecture. And you have a very secure way of transporting those devices, too. Yeah, from, well, from we didn't set out to do it. But uh, the cash guys, the trucks, the guys with the guns, Loomis and Brinks and so forth, uh, Loomis is a partner of ours, and they actually service the ATM side to put the money in, but we talked them into actually taking the phones out in the cash bags and taking them back to the truck with the guns. And so right. we only have one contractor that services at one time. Okay. Anything else? You know, it's great to recycle phones and your service is really, sounds really great. Um, but wouldn't it be better if they were, phones were designed to fit cradle to cradle principles and companies would be responsible for collecting? That would be better. We are uh, not holding out for that. And so in the meantime, we are uh, solving it this way. <laughs> and, uh, God bless the guy that goes and tries to right? solve that. Um, Speaking of which, since you ha are, have been involved in so many entrepreneurial ventures, and you know that it's not just about being green, but it's about making money, and you just recently sold your company, what advice would you have um, for the entrepreneurs in this audience with a great green idea? You know, I think the main thing is to separate the, uh, the environmental stakeholder value proposition from the rest of it and build your uh, value proposition for the environment into the product, but don't make that the point for the, the, the other stakeholder. Mm -hmm. You know, most of us are uh, living not just in the rest of the world, but even in the U.S. We're, we're, surviving and we're in Maslow's hierarchy needs, we're, we're down here, water, food, uh, air. Uh, and so build your value proposition 
not save Mother Earth and, and save the planet, but because you'll get 10% of people to respond. You want 90%, you know, the other people to respond. And if your value proposition is built in and not the, the entire point, don't lead with that if, if, if you don't have to. Lead with uh, other things. It's faster, it's cooler, it's cheaper. And then when people buy it, the environmental value proposition is already there. So don't, don't confuse the two. All right. Well, I know we're out of time, so I'm going to bring Joel back up. Mark, thank you so Thanks. much. Go see his device. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.